Then he shouted to Saul, Why do you listen to the people who say I'm trying to harm you? This very day you can see with your own eyes it isn't true. For the Lord placed you at my mercy back there in the cave. Some of my men told me to kill you, but I spared you. For I said, I will never harm the king. He is the Lord's anointed one. Ukulele says a piece of his robe is smart, proof that he could have but didn't. There's also that. And uh, now he's using that as evidence to Saul of like, hey, I had an opportunity to kill you, but I didn't. So, whoever's telling you that I'm out to kill you, don't believe them. What's up, cool people? My name's Matt. Welcome back to our Bible study. All right. So now we're looking at 1 Samuel 24. And um, basically, we've had a wild goose chase of Saul trying to find David to capture him and kill him. David keeps getting away. He keeps finding out that Saul's on to him and moving elsewhere so that Saul doesn't get him. It was real close. Saul was real close to getting him in the last chapter. But then he found out the Philistines were attacking and decided that was a higher priority. Okay, here we go. 1 Samuel 24. And the footnote there to start things off is just saying that um, verse 1 here is actually verse 2 in the Hebrew text. The last sentence of the previous chapter in the original you know, Hebrew manuscripts is actually the first verse of this chapter. Basically, it just said that uh, David is now living among the strongholds of En Gedi. So, now, for real, we get to the rest of Hebrew chapter 24. After Saul returned from fighting the Philistines, he was told that David had gone into the wilderness of En Gedi. So Saul chose 3,000 elite troops from all Israel and went to search for David and his men near the rocks of the wild goats. At the place where the road passes some sheepfolds, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. But as it happened, David and his men were hiding farther back in that very cave. So, uh... Saul's on the hunt for David and unknowingly he gets real, real close to finding him. But, uh, he also is in a vulnerable spot here. Let's see what uh, David does, I guess. Verse 4. Now is your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power, to do with as you wish. So David crept forward and cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. But then David's conscience began bothering him because he had cut Saul's robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my lord the king. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one, for the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. After Saul had left the cave and gone, his way, gone on his way, David came out and shouted after him, My lord the king! And when Saul looked around, David bowed low before him. Alright, gotta pause there. <laughs> so David does not take this as a chance to kill Saul, even though he easily could have, as evidenced by the fact that he was able to go up and tear off a piece of of Saul's robe. I... I almost wonder if that was like a sign or like a test David was doing to see just how vulnerable Saul was in the situation or like how much he was able to see or know what was going on. Maybe. I mean, they were in a cave, so it's possible that uh, visibility wasn't exactly great all throughout it. Saul could have been in an especially dark spot. It doesn't say the exact circumstances there, but anyway, I, I get the sense David was trying to see, you know, 
whether or not Saul was actually like being delivered into his hands as his men sort of told him but then after tearing a piece of the robe he felt guilty about even just doing that or at least guilty about the idea of potentially killing Saul he's like no Saul was anointed by the Lord I can't do this to him but as Saul leaves the cave he being David comes out and gets his attention let's see what happens there verse 9 then he shouted to Saul why do you listen to the people who say I'm trying to harm you this very day you can see with your own eyes it isn't true for the Lord placed you at my mercy back there in the cave some of my men told me to kill you but I spared you for I said I will never harm the king he is the Lord's anointed one look my father at what I have in my hand it is a piece of the hem of your robe I cut it off but I didn't kill you this proves that I am not trying to harm you and that I have not sinned against you even though you have been hunting for me to kill me ukulele says a piece of his robe is smart proof that he could have but didn't there's also that and uh, now he's using that as evidence to Saul of like, hey, I had an opportunity to kill you, but I didn't. So whoever's telling you that I'm out to kill you, don't believe them. Because that's not what I have planned. And he also refers to Saul as his father here. Saul was his father-in-law. Uh, I mean, he had been... He got married earlier to one of Saul's daughters. So, like... Father isn't just a random word that's thrown in there. Or, like, an odd translation. Like, there was actually a familial connection there. But, anyway, so... David clearly shows he had the chance but didn't kill Saul hoping that maybe Saul will finally like ease off and stop trying to kill him at least that's what I I figure he's trying to do here but let's uh continue and see what else we learn verse 12 may the Lord judge between us this is still David speaking Perhaps the Lord will punish you for what you are trying to do to me, and what you are trying to do to me, but I will never harm you. As the old proverb says, from evil people come evil deeds, so you can be sure I will never harm you. Who is the king of Israel trying to catch anyway? Should he spend his time chasing one who is as worthless as a dead dog or a single flea? May the Lord therefore judge which of us is right and punish the guilty one. He is my advocate, and he will rescue me from your power. So now David's even bringing, you know, more of his thinking into this. Like, the way he sees it, it's just the situation as a whole, it seems, is that like, well, look, if God plans for... Saul to die and me to take the throne I don't have to be the one to do that <laughs> that's not saying that in every situation we should just be passive or whatever but it's also saying that like we don't have to make things happen just because we think they're within God's will there should be like clearer signs even than that <laughs> Of what God wants us to do. And like there's still a way for Saul to die. Without David killing him. And for David to then still. Be the king. David doing things. Doing things better than Abraham and Sarah. <laughs> yeah. Doing things better than a lot of people. 
thus far in the Bible, let's be real. Not figuring out his own way to make it happen. Right. Yeah, there's... There's a lot of people in the Bible, actually, who tried to make things happen their own way. Like Abraham. And, well, Abraham and Sarah. They both were kind of like, hey, um, God says you're supposed to have many descendants. Um, you're old, though. Shouldn't we kind of get that moving? But... David is taking a totally different approach with his situation and being like, all right, well, it looks like I could be, you know, given an opportunity here to kill Saul, but I don't want to do it unless I'm absolutely sure. And, um, with, given his conscience getting the better of him after tearing off a piece of the robe, it, it seems pretty clear that that's not the way that God wanted things to happen. So anyway, basically David here is saying, all right, I'm not going to take this into my own hands. I will let the Lord decide what's going to happen between us here. So... On to verse 16. When David had finished speaking, Saul called back, Is that really you, my son David? Then he began to cry. And he said to David, You are a better man than I am, for you have repaid me good for evil. Yes, you have been amazingly kind to me today. For when the Lord put me in a place where you could have killed me, you didn't do it. Who else would let his enemy get away when he had him in his power? May the Lord reward you well for the kindness you have shown me today. And now I realize that you are surely going to be king, and that the kingdom of Israel will flourish under your rule. Now swear to me by the Lord that when that happens, you will not kill my family and destroy my line of descendants. So David promised this to Saul with an oath. Then Saul went home, but David and his men went back to their stronghold. So, it seems at least in this moment that Saul is, you know, actually wising up in a sense and realizing David doesn't actually want to kill me, maybe. Um, nor does he want to completely get rid of my family line. Or at least he kind of confirms that with the oath that they made with each other at the end of this conversation. Because, I mean, that that was really probably even more than himself. His concern was probably that, like, his whole family would end up dying by David's hand. Because, like, he kind of had the sense that David was going to be king. Uh, he may or may not... It, it doesn't say outright whether he knew that David had been anointed as the next king... Um, but either way, his suspicions of David's eventual rule were kind of coupled with paranoia over the death of him and his family. So, he kind of wanted some reassurance from David that his family wouldn't die, even if and when he did. Because a lot of times, whenever someone who's not a direct descendant of the previous king became king, it was a matter of, well, we kind of got to kill off any family members and anybody who would have been loyal to the previous king so that they don't end up, like, getting revenge on us or trying to usurp us back. <laughs> that was such common practice that it was probably assumed by Saul that that's how he would lose his kingdom. But, basically through this conversation, there seems to be reassurance that it's not going to happen that way. However, David, you note, and his men, went back to their stronghold, not back to Judah. 
Saul was kind of prone to very quick and drastic changes of heart. So, I, I could definitely understand David not quite wanting to trust that Saul's going to completely leave him alone at this point. Now, some of that could have been due to the tormenting spirit that was described in previous chapters that plagued Saul. Um, it, 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 we're not given exactly all the reasons why Saul might have been so, uh, you know, back and forth with his intentions. But I definitely understand David not quite trusting all of this at the moment. So that's why they still part ways. It also might have looked a little weird if David just went with Saul in this situation. <laughs> Saul's men might then end up being like, wait, weren't you out to kill David? He's right here. Let's do it. <laughs> so kind of avoids that potential situation as well. Uh, ukulele says... It is complicated. If you go back a little ways, David kills Goliath, Saul takes him into his house, and David becomes besties with Saul's son, Jonathan. Yeah, they were like family. And David, as I said before, was married to Saul's one daughter. So, it, like, it's definitely not just a simple, like, okay, you've got one person who's current king, and another person who's anointed to be the next king. There's no relation to each other or anything like that. No, there's some complicated dynamics going on there, and definitely some deeper connections. So anyway, uh, yeah. I, I think that's about all I've got, though, on uh, 1 Samuel 24 here. Okay, so David here had ample opportunity to kill Saul if he wanted, and he did not. So, maybe at least for the moment, Saul's fears of David, you know, violently usurping his throne are put to rest. But David still doesn't, like, leave with Saul and go back to uh, Judah. I don't know if it was Jerusalem exactly, but back to Judah at least. Uh it, David is still out in the wilderness because uh, it's not exactly stated why, but given Saul's kind of back and forth on, you know, whether or not he's actually going to try and pursue and kill David, it's kind of understandable if he is a little skeptical or hesitant to just be like, okay, it's all good now. Might just be a, okay, we're good for the moment. So anyway, as always, like and share if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe to the channel and click the bell if you're on YouTube to get updates when I post new videos. If you're seeing this anywhere else, give me a follow or whatever you got to do for that platform. Look down in the description for info on social media pages and other places to find and follow my activity. And leave comments down below all that with any thoughts you have. <laughs> so that'll do it for now. Hope you're all doing well. Hopefully I'll see you soon for another video. But whatever the case is, till next time, stay cool, people.